Okay, so good morning, Brittany. How are you doing? Morning, I'm very good, thank you. A little bit chilly, but very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it'd probably be a useful bit for us to start off is just to sort of share with everybody else where the two of us first met, okay? Yeah. Um, so first met yourself, Brittany, uh, One Great George Street in London. And for those of you who haven't been there, it's a big domed Edwardian building, which is the, the home of the Institute of Civil Engineers, absolutely saturated in civil engineering history. Um, I was there feeling a little bit uncomfortable. So uh, we, we were there watching a presentation, lots of people clearly smarter than me, wearing sh sharper suits, talking about important things. And, you know, it, it did make me feel a little bit uncomfortable. And then out of the corner of my eye, Brittany skips up the steps, we're off her bike, wearing her trainers, takes off her helmet, puts it down and, and sort of dives straight in. And because of that, you, you know, I'm not speaking your ego here. You really did stand out. You you, you were very different to, to most of the other people in the room. And fast forward for today, um, I'm, I'm really grateful you're able to, to come and spend some time with me so you can sort of share some of your experiences um, and hopefully you can have sort of a, a similar impact on some of the people who get to watch this session. So are you, are you good to make a start? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, today what I'd really like to focus on is your experience of how uh, innovation can work in a, in a workplace context um, and, and how as, as leaders we can look to incentivize innovation within the organizations that we work in. To give everybody a bit of context, um, Brittany, you're the co-founder and CEO of Qualifo, so a, a, a tech company that's looking to leverage uh, AI and machine learning to help the civil engineering sector become more sustainable. So innovation is clearly a word which you probably say out loud quite often and you're, you're very uh, used to hearing from others. And let's be honest, lots of organisations like to associate themselves with it. Um, most marketing messages like to say that uh, in innovation is looking at converting new ideas, new knowledge into new products um, and ultimately commercialising those to put them into use. So an, an obvious question to start off with, what, what does innovation mean to you and, and how do you relate it to the work that you do? That's a good question. I think innovation ultimately is is solving an old problem in a new way or a new problem in an old way or a new problem in a new way sometimes. Um, but quite often it can be something that's, you know, quite dry. It doesn't have to involve deep tech. It doesn't have to involve AI for it to be innovative. It can be a way of looking at, you know, quite a, a boring issue like paper. Um, having too much paper to manage and you don't know what to do with it um, and actually solving it in quite a simple way with some old tech that you've stolen from another industry or that you've you've seen applied elsewhere which is in part what what we do is so uh, is sort of helping the construction industry to capture the reams of paper that come on site with uh, their goods received notes and their waste transfer notes um, and currently that's a very manual process and very painful and what we've done, a lot of people call innovation, but what we've done is really we've taken a technology that we've seen in other industries. You'll see it in your accounting software where you take photographs of receipts um, and we've applied that in a new space. And that is innovation, but it's not that we've invented something entirely new. Um, it's actually that we're just tackling a very old and painful problem in a new way. Um, and, you know, on the flip side of that, it could be an entirely new problem, but actually that you're tackling in in quite a traditional way um, but because it's a new problem that you've seen that needs a, a different approach then actually I would still call that innovation so it doesn't have to be sexy or you know completely out there it doesn't have to be Elon Musk inventing new flamethrowers like it doesn't have to be that way it can be um, a lot more pragmatic and it can still be innovation. So I think Adam Grant calls it recombination so it's taking ideas from different sectors twisting it, tweaking it, rebranding it and, and applying it in a, in a, in a different setting. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to make, make a couple of presumptions here. As, as a, a relatively young organisation, I'm going to make I'm going to presume that some of your, your stakeholders have an expectation that the organisation will continue to grow, i.e. you're creating shareholder value, um, which is going to be greater than the perceived risk that they may have in in providing your, your organisation with equity. So do you think that sort of accessing innovation has any relationship with that ability to grow in the future? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's there's two sides of it. The the first sort of challenge that we certainly came up against really early was because we are providing innovative technology to an industry that has a reputation um, for not being very digital, for not being very open to any form of risk. Um, it that was not particularly attractive to investors 
three, four years ago when we were first raising investment. Um, and so we had to build a really clear roadmap and a really strong narrative to show our investors that yes, okay, construction is risk averse and yes, it's it, it's not particularly digitally literate at the moment, but this is the journey it's going on and we can be part of that journey and we can actually be right at the front of that wave. So I think that certainly had an impact on us um, from the way that the industry approaches innovation externally, but also internally with us. Um, as you said, we're a small company that's growing. So we're we were, I think when we first met, we probably would have only been, you know, six people. We're now 20. Um, we're going to be 50 by the end of next year. Um, and capacity and sort of resource is always a challenge for us because we're always doing far more than we actually have the physical resource to do. And so we always look at innovations, but also just digital solutions to help us do more with what we've got or to do more with less. So it's either increasing our capacity internally or our capabilities. So upskilling our, our current uh, resource. And so I think we have a sort of digital first mindset, I guess, but really an innovation um, approach to try and say, can we solve this problem in a new way to make sure that we're actually able to get ahead to to really continue that growth and accelerate and also get, provide those returns to the people who are backing us, but also value to our clients. So, so I didn't hear the word, but I think what you're intimating there is it's got to be sustainable. So, so this isn't just about quick return. This is about organic growth to something which can be sustained. Yes, and I think that is that's something that obviously Jade and I are incredibly focused on, and it's it has been or was particularly a few years ago quite a challenge to explain to our investors. Um, I think the typical venture capital background um, often looks for really, really rapid growth and quick quick returns which doesn't necessarily mean they're sustainable and we have seen some of these unicorn companies implode and therefore you know investors um lose their funding i mean katera was a fantastic example of mm-hmm. um basically trying to consume the industry in this in this approach where they literally were buying up massive companies and just trying to in-house them and they were growing obscenely fast but it wasn't sustainable they couldn't maintain any level of knowledge transfer or cultural um support and so it, it imploded um and so i think we've spent a lot of time seeking out the right investors um more so than trying to educate the market we've actually just sort of said no we're going to be quite picky with the people that we work with so that they understand that we as a construction tech provider will grow slower than you know sort of a consumer tech that like instagram that you know explodes overnight um, but what we will do is we'll deliver sustainable growth that actually continues to generate very high returns um and will provide something that not only is valuable but also something that the industry and the environment needs um and we this this recent round that we've done, we've brought in a lot of impact investors to really make sure that that narrative is protected within our board structure and within the way that we govern the company, um, that sustainability, carbon, environment, um, you know, social governance are at the very top of our agenda and that that is protected at a board level and that has an equal seat to, you know, cash flow and finance and, um, you know, sort of legal side of things as well. Um, so I think something which we can agree on from what you're saying then is that you know stimulating innovation is clearly important and, and traditionally there are several ways you can do it. You can look at things like developing teams, uh, sorry, developing new products across different teams. You can look at setting up corporate incubators, uh, listening posts, forming alliances with people outside of your organisation um, or, or, also, or, or also creating things like uh, open innovation systems. So this is taking things from academia, from other organisations, from other sectors, that recombination idea. So recognizing the sort of relationship that innovation has with your organization's ability to create value what sort of things do you do to sort of increase your chances of finding innovation and then actually exploiting it as an organization how do you do what you do it's interesting because i don't i think we wouldn't sort of classify it as innovation day to day but i think it's because everything we do is sort of innovation so we don't sort of talk about it in that way as much as more as um problem solving and the way that we go about that is ultimately just listening to the industry um and i think it's in a way it's a sort of recombination piece again but what it is is um there are there are members of our team who understand the industry very well 
and can build really strong relationships there. So um, my co-founder and I are both from construction and so we sort of understand the language and some of the challenges that are there. Um, Polly in our in our um, Grace team, our sustainability lead, she has she's also from from the construction industry. She's ex Ganska. Um, and so we have that sort of industry relationship and we spend a lot of time talking to our clients and saying, you know, why is this painful? How are you using the tool in this way? What are you getting out of it? But then we also bring in the tech side. And so our CTO, Stefan, who will has no experience in the industry and so isn't coloured by the preconceptions or the sort of um, the, I guess, the cynicism that a lot of people from the industry do have and can challenge stuff and say, well, have you thought about this thing or oh, we could look at that this way. And so by bringing in people who aren't too close to the problem, can, who can give it a completely different perspective is ways that we often find um, new approaches or new opportunities, new avenues to explore. And it was really interesting when we very first started Qflow, Jade and I had been in the industry just long enough to know that there was a massive problem that could be solved that was sort of uncovered and untouched at the moment, but not so long that we were so cynical and worn down that we didn't want to touch it with a barge pole. And so we came out of the industry and started um, basically upskilling in the tech space and started understanding what was possible with IoT, with machine learning, with AI, and then started looking at how we could solve those problems in a completely fresh way. And now we basically just iterate around that. So I think the way that we approach it is very much listen to the industry, really understand the pain point, really understand where the workflows are, but then allow the tech experts to say, well, you could try solving it this way and then sort of experiment around that. And we have iterated a lot and we've, you know, we've moved away from certain approaches. We've definitely moved away from IoT because we felt like that wasn't it's an amazing system so internet of things and um, devices are amazing for tracking certain things but they weren't going to solve the waste and material problem in the industry at scale and so that's why we've taken a completely different approach um, but we did explore that and came back and i think it's really important to try not to solve things within your bubble with your own perceptions try and get the external opinions who have seen other ways of living other ways of doing um to really enable you to explore these other avenues that could be the most valuable and the most efficient. So I think let's let's take innovation as a headline and break it down into sort of its, its four traditional parts. So product, process, business model and, and managerial. Focusing first on product innovation, which let, let's define this as the introduction of new products, services or features. So if you, if you think of the, of the Qflow product, clearly that aligns quite nicely with, with that definition. Um, Jeffrey Moore, use this phrase first, the idea of crossing the chasm. So this is taking an innovation, taking an idea and actually scaling it to a point where it becomes commercially viable. And the idea that actually no matter how good the idea is, is if you can't move it from innovator through to early adopter, you're, you're not going to get that critical mass to enable it to actually to become something which can be sustained into the future. Mm -hmm. So thinking back to maybe some of your, 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 your former years, have you got any thoughts here on how you can take innovation from that uh, that early innovator stage through to something where actually you are starting to get enough users, enough market share that it becomes it becomes viable. So from a technical perspective, I would say, I mean, people may have heard of the minimum viable product MVP. Mm -hmm. um, always try and build the MVP as minimal as possible. Um, and what we built for Canary Wharf was their experience was of a fully automated, fully functioning tech platform really what it was was Jade and I doing everything manually in the background um, and they sort of they knew that we were, we were quite transparent about the fact that you know it wasn't fully built but we were giving them the experience to find out whether it was valuable um, and that helped us firstly validate that yes this was a problem worth solving because they then went to procure it and then we were like god we've got to build this thing um, which was good but also it meant that we very quickly eked out what wasn't valuable and so and one of the first things we did was we stripped out all of the functionality of the app. So it was just taking a photograph. There was no typing in of anything because we needed to eliminate as much friction as possible at the site end. And we needed to make sure that because there's a really high turnover on sites, particularly within the logistics workforce or sort of like the gateman, um, it had to be something that anyone could pick up and just understand that all they've got to do is take a photograph. And that was it. Um, and so. <laughs> that sort of minimum viable product focus meant that we could very quickly 
understand what part of the technology was most important to build first and what bits literally are not adding value and we could not waste time on. So that's from a technical perspective of like basically delivering that that product and starting to cross that chasm. Obviously, at that point, we then also had to figure out how to make that tech scalable. And that's what we've been doing for the last um, sort of year and a half. We're now there and it is scalable. But there was a time where we were having to go through a lot of pain um, to actually make sure that the machine learning was learning enough and quick enough to release the um, information to our clients in a time frame and to a quality that was actually adding value. And so we we've sort of created this multi tiered process where you've got the machine learning doing the majority of the lifting, but actually humans doing that final check to make sure that the quality is there. And if you don't have that, you just won't have enough quality. You won't have a high enough quality of data for the industry to use it. So, yeah, that sort of scalability pain point was was pretty high. Um, but we're now through that. We've crossed that technical chasm and that product chasm. The other bit is about finding those early adopters and reaching the so you will have seen the sort of bell curve where you have like the pioneers, the early adopters, then the sort of the majority and then the laggards. Um, our industry is skewed, I think, but it's changing. So I think we're skewed to having a lot of the sort of middly a lot more laggards than most industries do have because we are very risk averse as an industry. However, I think that's changing. But I particularly think the pandemic has changed that. I think people are massive open to digital they're a lot more open to trying new things um, so that's really helped that's pushed a lot more people into sort of the early adopter space or at least into that middle band um, but for us the way that we managed to cross that first chasm was almost sort of brutal filtering and saying like if we spoke to a laggard we'd be like great no worries I get that you're not ready for this technology will come back to you in a few years time when you're there, but then not wasting time on them. And then when you find someone who really is an early adopter, who is a pioneer, like the guys at Canary Wharf, um, like James Pellet at GPE, he's an absolute superstar. Um, and when they latch on, really working with them to make sure that firstly, they that you're hearing what's important to them and that you understand their pain points and that you're really making sure that you've built that strong relationship and our industry is so relationship based so spending just spending time and understanding how you can help make their day to day easier but then also empowering them to share that message um and so i think probably 80 90 percent of our work to date has come by direct referral because people love what Qflow does they validated themselves and because they're respected in the industry other people then take it more seriously and that sort of very organic growth has helped us cross the chasm to the point now where we're getting people saying oh yeah I've heard of Qflow yeah that would help me do this right let's go um, and so we don't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting anymore because it's sort of been done by our pioneers and our early adopters who have fallen in love with the system um, and the team as well. I think one of the main bits of feedback that we always get is that the team are great to work with. And I'm not saying myself, I'm saying the guys in, in the team and um, the team are great to work with. They're really responsive. They really hear what the pain points are. They take that on board um, and that really we're there to work with the industry and be on the same side as the table of the table and really make sure that we're both working towards a more sustainable construction process not that we're trying to sell them something because in reality if if it's not the right tool for them there's no point in us working with them either so it's very much filtering through saying is this actually going to make your life easier do you have the same values as us in terms of wanting to build a more sustainable construction industry if so yes let's work together on this and get it to the next stage how do you see the way your organization operates as impacting on its long-term growth are you looking at sort of fundamental changes to how the, how the organization operates are you looking to your peers to see how they do it are you trying to come up with unique ways of doing it to differentiate yourself um, is this something even on your consciousness it definitely at front of mind all the time and I'd say we do a bit of everything so I'm part of a construction tech founder network called the CTEC club um, and we are constantly sharing new lessons or challenges and basically knowledge and experience so that we can all try and build more sustainable more effective companies that people want to work in um, so definitely learning from our peers um, and looking at companies who are just a few stages ahead of us who are already at the sort of 100 employee stage and saying what was painful for you how did you get here how can I most make sure that you know my team are happy and that they're um, delivering value like nurturing their learning and growth um, so yeah definitely learning from peers but we also do try and do things differently so 
Um, we're a female, female founded company um, and that does mean that we do things a bit differently and we found this a lot and it's not, um, it wasn't sort of intentional. We haven't actively gone and said we're going to do it differently. It's just the way that Jade and I approach things um, and we find it is very different to our male founded peers. Um, and so we're trying to, we've actually gone through a bit of a process of trying to unpick why that's the case and where that's good and where that's maybe not so good and there are a lot of things that are maybe not so good I think Jade and I are a lot less combative which is lovely because actually um, we had an all hands last week with the entire team and they were saying you know everyone feels very comfortable they're very at home and um, everyone is incredibly honest and we share a lot of uh, we share the pains openly and we share the sort of failures and the lesson learns and that means that we actually probably make less of those um, problems in the future and that those less those sorts of failures are actually very valuable because we're constantly drawing on that experience and so that's a really positive thing however it does also mean that sometimes things don't get confronted as quickly as they should and so luckily Jade and I are very talk and cheese and I will normally call something out very very quickly um, whereas Jade will think it through a lot more and take that time to digest it which isn't necessarily a women's thing but um, I think there are aspects of the way that we um, run internally um, the company is very different to the way that traditionally sort of um, sort of very macho male run companies are are run and there, there's pros and cons to both but we're sort of trying to unpick that um, and I guess that's an innovation in cultural operation. No absolutely. <laughs> but yeah the, the sort of the overall culture of Qflow I think is very different to um, a, a, a different a different founder company. And I think the thing that has meant that we've been able to be so successful so fast um, is actually because we're so different. And so I think the the strongest thing in terms of building a team, and we think about this in a huge, huge amount every single time we hire, we think not only does this person have the technical skills to do what we need to, but do they have the right culture and personality to complement what we've already got in the team and we've recently turned down a hire because they were too similar to the team we've already got and we didn't feel like that was going to um, bring the sort of um, cognitive diversity or the neurological diversity that we needed to help that team accelerate and grow and push it it was just going to perpetuate the existing system which is a good system but it's not going to push us to that next level and so being really aware of people's um, strengths and weaknesses is so important and blending them because there's no you, if you had a company full of reds it would be carnage and nothing would happen <laughs> Everyone would just be like my way is the way Absolutely. Um, whereas actually having that really nice complement compliment, complementary setup with red and yellow and then blue and green actually means that jade and i work incredibly well as a team and we do disagree regularly but we find really constructive ways to move forward um, I think that's the most valuable thing I've learned so far. Brittany, genuinely, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been great to sort of unpack your your view on innovation and, and how it creates value within your, the organisations that you've worked with. Um, it, it strikes me that actually failure to sort of set the environment, set the conditions to allow innovation to flourish both inside your organisation and to access it outside the organisation ultimately might mean that your organisation is no longer viable. You, you, you're sort of you're, you're limiting your options in the future. And and I think speaking as somebody who was an early adopter of a mini disc player, um, that's something which I've, I've definitely seen play out in, in reality. So thanks again for your time um, and for your insight today. It's been really interesting to hear your perspectives and, and I'm absolutely confident that people watching this will be able to take away two or three points that they can sort of weave into their own practice. So thank you very much, Brittany. Fantastic. Cheers, David. Have a good day. You too.